In the first part of the double shot, we had a few cliffhangers. First, JR set Bobby up, ensuring he'd go in the hole if he wanted to get back in with the cartel. Second, Mitch Cooper implied he was breaking his engagement to Lucy thanks to the Ewing meddling. And third, Mitch's sister Afton debuted, promising JR a future role in the hay if he lets her smell the money. Uh -huh. Mitch is still on a tear about wanting to avoid Ewing money, but both women and his family scold him for being selfish and pig-headed. His mother tells him to reconsider the marriage, and condo at least. After all, Lucy is such a great girl, and you can't go wrong with a condo. I do really like the parallels to the Shepard family, even if the outcome is different. In fact, especially because the outcome is going to be different. Afton is basically being put in the same position that Sue Ellen and Kristen were, where she has to trade her body for money, and this is mostly with her mother's blessing. It's only because Mitch is so strong-willed and opposed to money with strings attached that Afton begins to see that later. I mean, she does learn the hard way, but she doesn't fall into the same trap Kristen did. At Ewing Oil, Brady York begs Bobby to reconsider jacking up the price of oil, but Bobby tells him he's over a barrel. Bobby says he can cut the price in half if Brady comes up with $12 million up front. Brady doesn't think it could be done. Well, not with that attitude. Back at the ranch, Chalk is puzzled as to why Mitch isn't just taking the money and the girl, but Ellie says she admires the way he told Jock and JR to shove it. She laments that her darling Gary won't be back for the wedding, though, and she blames Jock for chasing him off all those times. She also throws a little shade Ray's way, clearly upset that Jock prefers his bastard child to Gary. Fun fact, bastard is technically a gender-neutral term for any fatherless child. That's one of those, you learn something new every day items. At the store, two-time employee of the year Pamela Ewing gets roped into having lunch with Harris and Paige. But speaking of two-timing, Alex Ward pops his head in and hits on Pam. Pam excuses herself and Liz, high-quality friend, tells Alex to buzz off. Alex promises to keep pestering Pam until she has sex with him. <laughs> Mitch visits South Fork to harp on Lucy some more, but Lucy rightly shoves him into the pool for being pompous. He still offers to marry her as long as he doesn't have to take the job JR offered him or the house that Jock offered him. They're taking the condo, though. Back at Ewing Oil, a week has passed very quickly, and Bobby needs the money from Brady York. Brady tells him not to bother and also schools him on Westar Oil's predatory capitalistic tactics. They're going to put all the independents out of business and then jack up the prices with no competition to worry about. Ha! Little does Brady know, those types of predatory practices are illegal. I mean, for that to happen, America would have to elect a president who would gut regulatory agencies and dedicate the government to the propagation of unrestrained vulture capitalism. As if Bobby didn't have enough problems, JR is scheming to pull the rug out from under him with the cartel deal, forcing him to sign a deal with Westar. What's more, Jordan Lee says that they're ready to drill. They just need that check from Bobby. Chuck and Ellie meet Val and Gary at the airport, they still haven't met Mitch, but it's not like Lucy is all that close with her parents anyway. Bobby decides to drown his sorrows with Connie. He doesn't want to go home, and there's a moment where it looks like Connie thinks he wants to go home with her. Poor Connie. She's quite the catch, and she deserves better. Bobby finally does arrive home and gets told off by Pamela for the shit millionth time this season. There's just no forward momentum with any of these arguments. No reconciliation, no breaking up. Just Victoria Principal doing her wide-eyed yelling thing once an episode. At the hangover swim meet, Bobby tells Gary he's got a greater appreciation for JR's backstabby tactics now that he's running things. He always thought he could run an ethical business and still make money, but now he's not so sure. No. No. No, 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 no. We cannot let that one go, Bobbert. Ewing Oil would have been plenty profitable leaving Brady York's business in place, or even helping him shore up in the face of Westar Oil's takeover attempt. It just wouldn't have been as profitable. And it wouldn't have sucked up to the cartel or pleased Jock Ewing. None of these are things Bobby had to do. He just wants to be able to screw people over and get the validation of being a good person. If you're going to be a bastard, Bobby, just be a bastard and admit it. JR knows he's a bastard. Ray's a bastard in the literal sense. And Gary... Well, he struck Valene in a drunken stupor and then took advantage of his Alcoholics Anonymous sponsee's bender to sleep with his wife, thus betraying Valene and the sponsee. 
Oh, and he's got a mafia deal going behind Sid Fairgate's back, so Gary is not exactly making the list of non-bastards right now. On the topic of bastards, JR is just a quiverin' with glee as today is the day Bobby is gonna piss off Jock and get deposed as acting president. At Cliff's, Donna shows off her sundress and implores him to go to the wedding, but Cliff has already started the process of cliffing this relationship by getting jealous over Ray Krebs being there. Nice to see he's on schedule for screwing this up. I was getting a little nervous there. Jeremy Wendell arrives for the big contract signing, but first, Bobby corners him on the gasoline rumor. Wendell basically admits that Weststar has no intention of opening more gas stations. They're gonna hoard the oil until the price shoots up, and then they're gonna hoard it some more. <laughs> Wendell tells Bobby he shouldn't be concerned because he got his money. We don't actually see Bobby sign. He did ask Connie to come in with him to witness the signature though, and that is the last we will ever see of Connie as she makes her way to Mandyville. Deborah Tonelli's Phyllis Wapner would take over the next episode, and we never look back. At the wedding, Sue Ellen's old boyfriend, Clint Ogden, is an invitee. Turns out JR stole Sue Ellen from Clint. Clint, by the way, is played by Monty Markham, who got his start in the original Mission Impossible and is still going strong, having appeared in Tim Robinson's I Think You Should Leave and doing an abundance of voice acting. Good for him. Alex Ward is also an invitee, and of course, he starts buzzing around Pamela. Turns out he's doing a piece on Texas weddings. I mean, I have a degree, but no practical experience in the field. But he probably could have sent a feature writer to write this piece instead of showing up himself. Pamela politely excuses herself, but Alex tells her that she can't run forever. When your seduction line sounds like it was ripped from the most dangerous game, you might be a creeper. <laughs> Lucy, meanwhile, gets her something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue from Ellie, Val, Pam, and Sue Ellen. Interestingly, this is the only time in either show that Jock and Ellie, JR and Sue Ellen, Bobby and Pam, Gary and Val, Ray and Donna, and Lucy and Mitch are all on screen together. The big moment comes, and despite the fact that Ted Shackelford is only six foot one, he and Charlene Tilton look like that picture of Shaquille O'Neal and Earl Boykin standing next to one another. The vows cause the various philandering and potentially philandering couples to share some glances, except weirdly Donna and Ray. Ray and Donna do spot each other though, and Donna gets a highly erotic adjustment of Ray's tie before some lady interrupts them. Thought Teresa was gonna have to turn the hose on him. Clint also takes the opportunity to catch up with Sue Ellen. Her life is an open book thanks to the newspapers, but he tells her he's been busy in the electronics business. Turns out he invented a pie-shaped character named Pac-Man and sold the rights for a cool 2,000 bucks. So you could say something of a mogul. Ray and Gary finally get to talk to one another, and Gary thinks it's great that Ray's been keeping it in the family. And by that, I mean the ranch at South Fork, of course. Nothing else. And since Ray is a Ewing, Gary doesn't have to worry about coming back one day to make sure the ranch is run by a Ewing. That doesn't really make any sense anyway, because the ranch was really only important to the Southworth side. The Ewings were the oil people. And Ray ain't a Southworth. The look on Ellie's face lets us know that Ray just burst her bubble. That can't bode well. Speaking of bursting, JR and Afton finish having sex, and Afton tries to assure him that she's not easy, he's just special. He tells her that he'll give her a nice parting gift on her way back to Mississippi, but Afton has other ideas about staying in Dallas. Boy, does she. Outside, the klutzy waiter spills a drink on Sue Ellen, so she goes upstairs to change. Fortunately, Afton has already gotten dressed and rejoined the party. Sue Ellen already suspects something, though, and her suspicions are confirmed when she sees that the bed is all sexy. At the reception, Bobby blows off Pamela, who tells him he's either too drunk or too tired to connect with her when he's home at all. Alex tells her he's puzzled by Bobby's indifference. Donna lets Ray know that she's aware that he's a Ewing because Lucy has been trying to get them back together. Ray still doesn't think it would work between a cowboy and a politician, and Donna says it's too late anyway because she's with... Ugh. Cliff. Hopefully, now that Ray is a rich Ewing, he can afford to steam out the wrinkles from the backdrop in this scene. In the parlor, it turns out that Bobby actually did turn down West Star. He tells Jock and JR he wants out of the oil business and JR can have it. He's sick of the wheeling and dealing. But everything is okay with the cartel because he hooked them up with another oil company, so the deal is still good. Just not for the Ewings. JR grouses about Bobby costing them millions and now he'll have to put everything back together again. But Jock scolds him and tells him that Bobby kept the Ewing name with integrity and made a killing in business. And he's proud of him. 
Jeez, Jock, why don't you just punch him in the nuts on your way out? Outside, Clint tells Sue Ellen about how all the memories came flooding back to him when he saw her. But he's married. It just so happens, though, that he caught Sue Ellen at the perfect time for infidelity. Finally, Miss Ellie tells Jock off, saying that his Ray Krebs has taken her Gary away from her for good. It's quite the unhinged reaction from Ellie, but it's also clear she's been holding this in for quite a while. And we're out. Lucy and Mitch mostly take a backseat to the rest of the Ewing shenanigans. First up, nature heals itself as JR returns to the fold in Ewing oil, even if it's not the way he'd imagined. JR gets Lucy out of the picture, sleeps with Afton, and gets Ewing oil back all in one day. I'd say that's a pretty solid outing for John Ross Jr. Bobby, on the other hand, continues his downgrade. His relationship with Pamela is in shambles, which he has to keep relearning for the past 10 episodes like he's Guy Pearce and Memento. His ethical Ewing oil experiment actually was successful, but it was hard, so he decided not to do it. Plus, he lost Connie. I'm sure the subtext was that she was falling in love with Bobby and just had to get out of there because she couldn't have him. They certainly seem to be pushing the two of them closer together over the past few episodes. I like to think that she was upset that he called her into the office to be a witness to a signature and then changed his mind and she was just tired of him being wishy-washy. But that's headcanon for you. The big news, of course, comes at the very end, with Miss Ellie laying in to jock about his son taking Gary away from her. This is a woman who never visits Gary once, despite having very few obligations and basically limitless resources. Ah, well. I'm sure that now that she's gotten that off her chest, we won't be hearing any more about it. <laughs>